Okay, children, if you'd like to follow Miss Amanda. Boy, I tell you what, it really hurts a preacher's ego for whenever he stands up to preach, folks get up and start to ease out. They have a great time back there. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to be looking verse 17 down through verse 21. And uh, as Brother Allen and, uh, was singing a while ago, and blessing our hearts uh, with the song that he was singing, Concerning Every Knee Shall Bow. Listen, that is not only a song that is sung, but it's a truth that uh, the Scripture proclaims that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We've already dealt with that here in Philippians. And based upon that fact, based upon that fact, folks, you and I need to be living for there and not for here. And so look with me, if you will, and beginning with verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me. Mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation, that is, our manner of living, is in heaven, from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to do all things unto himself. Henry Van Dyke tells a story about the man who passed away and and uh, he uh, came to the uh, gate of heaven, and there was the welcoming angel, and the man asked the angel, said, Where is my mansion? And the angel told him, he said, Well, you got to understand that the mansions here are built on the material, built with the material that people send us ahead of time from earth. For instance, like that of being dedicated to Christ, commitment to his body, and sharing the gospel. And since you did not send any material ahead, you don't have one. Well, here, uh, as we look into our text, we find in verse 16 where the Apostle Paul spoke of living by a rule. He was saying, live by this rule, that is, live by the knowledge, within the knowledge and the boundaries of the knowledge that you have. Not only live within the boundaries of the knowledge that you have by this rule, by this understanding, but also be open to the future knowledge and understanding. And uh, that is, uh, listen, folks, there's never a time that I'll ever, there will never be a time in my life nor years that we will attain a place, a position to where we don't need to know more than what we know in relationship to our spiritual walk. And uh, so that is something that you and I need to comprehend and we need to seek after. We need to know as much as we can. We need to have as much knowledge as possible. And the more knowledge you have, the more understanding you will, you will have, then it's going to have an effect upon your personal spiritual walk and uh, how you deal with the circumstances of life here on earth. In verse 17 down through verse 21, the Apostle Paul there begins to talk about, he begins to talk about living for the there. That our lives are not in the here and now, but our lives are all about the there. In other words, there are so many people today who are emphasizing, put so much emphasis upon and importance upon what they have here, the home they live in, the car they drive, how much money they have in the bank. Paul says, listen for the saint of God that, I, that ought not to be the most important thing in your life is living for there. 
Because there will come that time when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And it's not going to matter whether you had one penny in the bank or whether you had thousands of dollars. It's not going to matter. What's going to matter is your allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I want you to note this morning, I want you to note some things concerning what the Apostle Paul says here within this text. There's basically four things that he that he uh, uh, speaks of uh, concerning living for there. And I want you to look at them with me, if you will. First of all, there is the pattern uh, in relationship to living for there. In verse 17, Paul says this. Look at it with me. He says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk as ye have us for an example. Now, listen to me. Paul makes it personal. Paul says, Paul says, listen, follow my example. Follow my example. The way in which you have seen me live, you follow my example. You know the reason why the Apostle Paul could say that? It's because the Apostle Paul had burnt all of his earthly bridges. I mean, they had already been consumed by the fire uh, of God in Paul's life. The, he had nothing here on earth that really was gravitating his attention outside of the proclamation of the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's all that mattered to Paul here on earth was the furtherance of that gospel. And so Paul had burnt all of his bridges. And so the only thing that was important to Paul was Christ and Christ alone. So Paul could say, listen, follow my example. But then I want you to note that not only does he, he uh, apply it in the personal sense, this pattern, but he also goes on to say, and he also not only does he apply it personally, but yet he also applies it to others. For instance, if you'll look there with me, he talks about the petitioners. In other words, there are others who were out there. It wasn't just Paul, but it was others. He said, and those others who were also uh, following uh, my example. In other words, you follow them. Look at them. Look at the pattern of their life and follow that pattern. Well, if you'll note that in verse 17, the uh, latter part of that verse, he uses the word mark. And that word mark means to take note. That is, follow these examples. Living for there has a certain pattern. Can you say, can you say, follow my example? What if others were following your example? Better yet, can I tell you that they are people who are following your example? Can I tell you that there are people that you don't know about that's looking at your life and looking at the example that you're living? And they are possibly uh, being affected by the pattern of lifestyle that you have and what you think is important? Can you say, can you say, listen, follow my example? If you can say that, Without it bothering you, it is because you have come to the place like the Apostle Paul that you have burnt your bridges. That that which is important to you is that which is of heaven and nothing here on earth. So there's the pattern. But secondly, I want you to note, not only do we find here a pattern, but in verse 18 we find a problem. For instance, in verse 18, listen to what he says. He says, for many walk, that is, there's many of them who do not follow this pattern. 
He says, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, here's the problem. First of all, the problem is the number, because he says, For they are a multitude. That's basically what it says. The word many there means that there's a multitude of people who are, who are not following this pattern, who are not following the example or the display of the life of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are those that, that are out there, and there are many of them, that are living a lifestyle that is, that is totally objective uh, that is objectionable to the Word of God and to what the Christian life is to be about. He says, for they are many. And so here the Bible says that in relationship to the multitude, he says, uh, I have often warned you about these. I warned you about them. But then I want you to note here, not only does he speak of this problem in relationship to the multitude, but he also speaks of it in relationship to the manner in which they were living. Paul says, if you'll note here, he says, For I have not only have I warned you, but I have warned you weeping. You know what that tells me, and it should tell you? That for the apostle Paul, this was a grave concern. He shed tears over this problem because of the many who were living uh, contrast to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, for they walk, their walk is one of being an enemy of the cross of Christ. What does the apostle Paul mean whenever he speaks of being an enemy of the cross of of Christ. When he speaks there of being the enemy of the cross of Christ, it speaks of a person who considers the cross of Christ of no importance. It is of no value. It is of no interest. It doesn't matter what they've heard. It doesn't matter of the fact that Jesus Christ, the perfect Son of God, went to a cross and there suffered and died, not for his sins, not for his sins, but for the sins of others. For every other human being's sins, Jesus Christ died. For all past, present, and future sins, Christ died for the sin of the world. And that he was buried and the third day he rose again. They say, I'm not interested. For me to embrace such a thing, I would have to deal with my own personal sin, so therefore I'm not going to deal with my personal sin. I don't want to deal with guilt because if I, if I, embrace, what, uh, if I embrace this truth, I'm going to have to deal with personal guilt in my life, and I don't want to do that. You know, Jesus said, Jesus said that men refused to come to him because they love darkness more than they do light. And so here Paul says, for they are an enemy of the cross of Christ. You remember the parable that Jesus told about the, about, uh, the two roads? There's one road that's narrow, and there's the other road that's broad. A narrow road is very difficult. You have to pay close attention. It's very difficult. It's not easy to go down a narrow road. But it's very easy to go down a broad road. I have some grandchildren who are at the age to where they think that they should drive my vehicle. And I assure you that the only roads I want to be, on, be with them on is the broad road because they need plenty of space, because it's difficult to drive a narrow road. Well, the Bible says that the way of the cross is a narrow road. And the reason why, the reason why people 
people will not follow that road is because in relationship to the narrow road, you have to deal with the cross of Jesus. And if you deal with the cross of Jesus, you have to deal with your own personal sin and personal guilt. And so here Paul says, for here is the problem. Yes, they are many that, that uh, refuse to follow this pattern. And not only are they many, but this is the matter in which they do it. They reject. They are rejecting the cross. And in rejecting the cross, you become an enemy of the cross. I want you to note a third thing here. Not only does Paul here speak of a pattern, not only does he speak of a problem, but he also speaks of a prediction. For instance, he, he gives a prediction here in relationship to where you are. First of all, if you will note in verses 19, uh, uh, in verse 19, he speaks concerning the ungodly. He says, whose end is destruction. Speaking of those who are the enemy of the cross. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Now, look at the ungodly and the prediction that are given. First of all, he gives their course. He says for their course, the course that they're on is one of destruction. In other words, they may think that everything is well now, that everything is A-OK, -okay, but they're blinded to the fact that they're coming to a point of destruction, that the way they are going is, is the way of death, or the way of destruction. It's not one of delight, but the end of that road, at the conclusion, there is not gain, but there's a loss. There is destruction. And so here he speaks of it, and he gives not only their course, he also gives their cause. He says, listen, concerning the ungodly, not only is their way a way of destruction, he says this is the cause of it. He says because their God is their belly. Now the word belly there speaks of appetite. In other words, they have an earthly appetite. In other words, they live based upon their five senses. Whatever tastes good, whatever they see that they like, whatever they feel, no matter what it might be, whether it be, be something that would be appropriate or inappropriate, it does not matter. They live based upon sensuality. And they live for that which feels good in the present. In other words, folks, today we call it situational ethics. In other words, if it feels good and culture says it's A-OK, -okay, then it is all right for me and this is the way in which I'm going to live my life. Listen, this is what I'm finding I saw a sign the other day that said, said uh, uh, pray for the old America because I sure do miss it. There's a lot of truth to that. We've had a, a tremendous rapid change in culture in America. I mean, it has accelerated, going the wrong way. Now for the last, well, since the 1980s at least, or really goes back further, probably to the 1960s, during the hippie era, whenever everything, you know, was let loose and everything was all right. If it feels good, do it. And we have that even more so today. And here the Apostle Paul speaks of that thinking and that lifestyle. In other words, if culture says it's all right, well then, it's all right. Listen, brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. Be honest with you, I've never have, since I've been saved, I've never lived in a culture that agreed with this word. 
There's never been a culture that has agreed with this word, not since I've been living. Of course, I hadn't been, but just a few years, you understand. But, but uh, I've never lived in a culture that agreed with the word. But God has never called you. God, has never, God did not save you. If you're saved, he did not save you to live based upon what the culture says. God has saved you to live upon what this word says. He hasn't called you to live by a standard that is, that is brought on by the world and the world's philosophy. He has, he has saved you in order for you to take and live by the pattern of what the Word of God says. And this is the pattern that you are to follow. It's what the Scripture proclaims. You need to understand that. Because if you don't understand that, there's going to be some consequences in your life that you're going to wish that you didn't experience. But then I want you to note, not only does it give their cause, it also gives their conduct. He says, for their conduct is one that should bring, be bringing shame. But it doesn't. And they live for the earthly. They mind earthly things. In other words, they put the earthly ahead of the spiritual. The earthly is of greater importance than the spiritual is. But then I want you to note also here that in relationship to prediction, not only does he give a prediction in relationship to the ungodly, he also gives a prediction in relationship to the godly. Now, folks, this is, this is something that, that uh, uh, should be uh, enjoyable to, to you and I because here is some enjoyment. Listen to what he says in verse 20. He says, For our conversation, that is our manner of living, is in heaven. For whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says our enjoyment, our manner of living, our lifestyle should be one that uh, portrays us focusing upon heaven. We're living for there, in other words, and not living for here. But then I want you to know that not only does he give an, uh, an enjoyment here, he also gives a little additional because there is some excitement uh, in what he says, he says, For whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul is saying, Listen, I'm looking for that day. I'm anticipating that day. I'm excited every time I think about it, which is very often, I'm sure, in the life of the Apostle Paul, that, uh, that uh, here, here I am, I, I'm, I'm focusing upon the day when Ever I'm going to see him face to face. And one day that will happen. One day that will be experienced. For some of us, it's not going to be long off. For some, it won't be long. Now, you could be here older and say, Well, Brother Tommy, because of my age, you're saying that because I'm older age. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I saw in the obituary column last week in my hometown paper, 26-year-old young lady who had passed away. You don't have to be old to go out into eternity. And so, for some of us, it's going to be quicker than others that we are going to see him, and we're going to see him face to face. And it could be speaking also not only of the fact of us going to be with him through death, but him coming again and taking us to glory in his, in his coming again. But here he says in the text, he says in the text that uh, for us, our lives are focused upon, should be focused upon the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there is a prediction. There's a prediction for the ungodly. Living for sensuality and living based upon your, your senses, your earthly carnal senses, that is destruction. A person who lives that kind of lifestyle does not know Christ. But the godly, for the godly, there is excitement and there is enjoyment because we're living for there and not for here. But then I want you to note quickly one other thing. 
And that is, not only do we find here a pattern, not only do we find here a problem, not only do we find here a prediction, but we also find a promise. Look in verse 21 with me, if you will. In verse 21, listen to what he says in regard to the saint. He says, who shall change our vile body? In other words, listen, here is the promise, brothers and sisters. Here it is. One day there's going to be a release. One day there's going to be a release. He speaks of the vile body. He's talking about this old this old earthly body, this old tabernacle, this old tent that we are now living in. Listen, this tent, this body is not you. It's not you. It's the body that you live in because you are spirit. And one of these days we're going to, we're going to relieve ourselves of these bodies of ours. And if you're having problem in your body, listen, get excited because there's coming a day whenever you won't have the problem. Because there's coming that time whenever we're going to be able to do away with these old vile bodies that we are now living in. These vile bodies that has the migraine headaches, the vile bodies that has the cancer, the vile bodies that has the poor eyesight, the vile bodies where that we don't we're not able to hear like we used to, the vile bodies that the causes us all these aches and pains. One of these days we're going to be able to get rid of these old bodies. And I find that as I get older, whenever it comes to this old body, folks, it don't get better. I'm having to use more WD-40 today than I've ever used in my life just to keep all the joints going, to keep them well greased. But there's a release. But not only, not only does he give a promise of release, he gives a promise of being refashioned. Listen to what he says. Not only do, are we going to be able to get rid of these vile bodies, but he says that we may attain, be, uh, that, is, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Now, I don't, I don't, I'm not able to understand and comprehend all that that means. I'm not able to do that. But I do know that Jesus Christ, that His body is glorious and all that that means. That, that is, I'm going to have a body that is going to be glorious. Because he says it's going to be like his body. His body is glorious. And so I'm going to be able to get rid of a vile body and get a glorious body. A body that will never wear out. A body that will never grow old. A body, a body that will be 100% disease free for all of eternity. God says I'm going to have that kind of body. Isn't that good news? Those of you who are having problems in this body, isn't that good news? It should be. And I want to tell you, for, for us younger folks, for us younger folks, as we get older, it's going to become even better news for us. And so he says there is going to be the refashioning of the body. And it's going to be glorious like his. And the Bible says that the source of it is going to be, that is the how it's going to be brought about, he is going to use the same power, the same working that uh, he is going to manifest whenever he subdues all things to himself. And that day is coming, and that is a promise to the saint of God living you're living if you've got a pulse you're living that means your heart's beating they consider you alive 
But my question to you is, and the question that I have for me, is what is it and where is it that we're living for? Are we living for the here? Let me tell you something that as, as we close out this morning, let, let me tell you what happens whenever you're living for the here. Whenever you're living for the here, uh, you know what you're going to experience? Every time you turn around, you're going to be down and out because there's going to be something here that's not going to be going your way. You're going to be down and out. You're going to be depressed. Uh, you're going to be upset because, you know, things are not working out like you thought they would. You're going to have problems. You're going to have situations, and those situations are going to be surrounding, and you're going to be wrapped up in them because, after all, you're trying to live for the here. But whenever you live for there, there's not a problem that you know that your Lord uh, cannot handle. There's not the first problem that he can't solve. And after all, even if you keep the problem, still there's coming a day whenever that problem is going to be laid aside because one day you're going to see Jesus and you're living for the there. I tell you what, whenever you're living for the there, the anxiety is not near as great. The worry, the concern, the ulcers, problems can be handled whenever you're living for the there. Amen. Where are you living for? Here or there? If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I can tell you you're living for the here because you're not prepared for the there. But you can be prepared by coming to know and trust Him. If you're here and you're a believer and God has spoken to your heart and you are not as committed, your focus is not where it should be, but today you come to realize that and you want to make Jesus Christ. You want to refresh yourself in him and renew yourself in, re, in recommitment of uh, living for him. And, and, and even more so, letting your focus be living for there. It could be that God is speaking to you about that. If so, you come as we stand and sing.